Take your Bible. Turn to um, 1 Peter chapter 2. This is the message I've been wanting to get to for a while. And um, I hope it's a blessing. I, I've mentioned this for several years. I've talked about this for several years in the past about I noticed one day that uh, if there's any type of, of office in the Bible or any, any sort of position where someone's in authority or someone is serving in a, in a certain area, um, you'll, I, I noticed that Christ then bears the title of, as the head of that particular office or that particular service or that particular uh, position or whatever it is, uh, that Christ was always the head of that. And I started in my mind, I just started counting, you know, different things in the Bible uh, where, you know, there's, there's the high priest. Well, Christ is the high priest. We'll get into that. And, uh, and I thought, boy, that'd be a good study to do. And when I saw uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 coming up, and I saw that it was part of our study of 1 Peter, I thought, well, maybe that'd be a good time to do that. So, I mean, it took me a little while, and you have to just kind of stop and think about, you know, different offices and different places there are in the Bible. And by the way, if you, um, if you think of anything else that I don't end up listing here, or if you think of something tonight uh, while I'm laying out these different offices, we'll raise your hand and, and uh, I will see if I have it on my list. Maybe there's something I missed. Uh, I know I didn't put this in here. Uh, let's uh, hold, hold your place there in First Peter and go back to Isaiah. I was thinking about this while we were singing uh, Christmas songs. And uh, by the way, I'm going to say this, okay? And this came out today in, uh, in the pure Bible study that I uh, recorded. Um, first of all, to, to those who do not have any sort of Christmas or December 25th uh, celebration, um, and you want to abstain from that or you want to refrain from that uh, because of certain issues and so on, I, I am completely fine with that. I really am. Um, you know, it, 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 I would not dare defile anybody's conscience. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about this when he talks about those that regard a certain day or those that regard every day. And he said, the one who regards a certain day, to the Lord they regard that. And those who regard all days, to the Lord they regard all of those days. And so, I mean, there, therein lies that liberty that we have in Christ. Is that we, you are at liberty if you, want, if you wanted to. John, let's say that you wanted to on, um, oh, I don't know, July 18th at 4.30 in the afternoon. If you wanted to have a celebration to celebrate Noah and all of the people and animals coming off the ark, you are free to do that. Now, what is it about July 18th at 4 o'clock that makes you think Noah came off the ark then, John? See, you don't know. You don't know that that was the day. Okay? Um... You could do that. Because um, some say, well, Christmas is not in any of the feast days that God gave. God commanded that, and Christmas is not there. Uh, neither is um, uh, that deal with Esther. Purim, they call it. Okay? That was a free will celebration that they decided to have after that deal with Esther and how God used her to save all the Jews who are still alive today because of her. And they just... Every year at that time, they do that. That's not, in, that's not in the commandments. That's not in the feast days that God gave, and yet they do it. Okay? There's no restriction on these things. So, there are those who don't want to have anything to do with December 25th or what they call Easter or anything like that, and I'm fine with that. Okay? However, there are accusations toward those that do. I'm getting them. I'm getting them in comments, I'm getting them in emails, I've got a letter on my desk from a woman who, want, who demands an answer from me, I'm, here's my answer, okay? To those of you who accuse 
godly people of having a pagan holiday, December 25th, okay? Let me remind you of something. The absolute worst pagan celebrating person in all of history was King Solomon. This man, because of his strange wives, built huge pagan temples. Not only that, he went into them, learned their religious practices, and practiced it with them intentionally. Burned incense in these temples. And he's in heaven right now. Now, the people that I know that on December 24th or December 25th or December 26th that want to bring honor to the Lord Jesus Christ by honoring his birth, his first coming into this world, and thus, I think, do a little foreshadowing of Christ's second coming to this world, I say to you, if that's the reason why you're doing what you're doing, keep doing it. Okay? Now, getting caught up in all this buying and, and, and running people over at Best Buy and Walmart and Costco just to get some kind of piece of junk that's $10 on sale, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, okay? But to accuse people of being pagans and thus they're not saved because they're doing this, just want to remind you that Solomon did far worse intentionally intending to go in and worship all these false gods with incense, learning their, and, and giving praise to these gods. And yet at the end of Solomon's life, he's writing the book of Ecclesiastes. And he said, boy, let me tell you about the lessons I learned in life. God still kept with him. God promised he would not take his mercy away from him. And that's exactly what God did. And so those of you who want to accuse people, just be careful about what you're accusing them of. Okay? Salvation is still not based upon works of either righteousness or unrighteousness. It's based upon faith and what you believe. And so anyway, just thought I'd throw that. That's my answer. All right? Then Isaiah uh, chapter, uh, what did I say? Isaiah chapter 9 is where I want to be. It's got me thinking about this. Here's some offices I missed. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. I want to sing Handel's Messiah here. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful! Capital W. Okay? So, to anybody out there who thinks they are wonderful, Jesus has got you by about a billion miles. Amen? Counselor! Anybody's ever had to go see a counselor for any reason, okay? Jesus tops them all in the counselor office. The mighty God. There is no stronger God than Jesus Christ. The everlasting Father. Well, that all, I don't see how that doesn't trip the Jehovah's Witness crowd up and the Mormon crowd. He is the everlasting... Now, you say, oh, I don't understand that, so obviously it must mean something different. No, obviously it means exactly what it says. Just believe what it says, amen? And when we get to heaven, we'll go, oh, that's what it means. I don't know what it is now, but we'll see it, amen? The everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. Now, there's princes all in the Bible, okay? And uh, one not in a Bible who thinks he's a prince, who called himself a prince, and then referred to himself as the artist formerly known as Prince, and then now he's Prince again. Jesus has got him topped by about a quadrillion miles. Amen? He is the Prince of all peace. Somebody say amen. Now, First Peter chapter 2. Turn there. Uh, let's read down a little bit to verse 25. That's our key text here. And uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse, let's start here in, um, oh, let's see here, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. 
Notice that even in that, as far as suffering, you could say that Christ is the chief sufferer. I mean, you may have had some pretty serious pain in your life. Maybe, maybe an injury that you received or some sort of pain that you had might have been maybe a degree worse than what Jesus suffered on the cross. But I'm telling you, what you didn't have during that suffering was the sins of the entire world hanging on you. Christ is the chief sufferer. Amen? So we follow his steps. He does not follow ours. Verse uh, 22, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, because all that suffering that Jesus went through, he complained not. He did not fuss at people. He did not get angry. Who then, who when, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Now it's funny that the charismatic word faith crowd pulls this verse out of Isaiah, out of Isaiah 53, where that's where he's quoting from, by his stripes we're healed, and says... Bless God, the purpose of Jesus on the cross was so that you could be healed of all your diseases. And if you have disease, why would you make Jesus suffer on the cross for your diseases and not be healed from your diseases? Obviously, Jesus wants you healed from all your diseases or he wouldn't have had those stripes. By his stripes, we're healed. They want to make a big deal about that. And a lot, in a lot of cases, and they got this from Finnis Day, that they equate healing with salvation. Because Dake taught, if you are saved... You'll never be sick. And if you are sick, it's obvious that you're mocking God and you've lost your salvation. You need to get it back. And guess what Finnis Dake said? That guy was nuts. But see, what he did was spawn all these other little Finnis Dake's people, these little Dake rats going all over the world preaching this same nonsense. And it's hard to talk people out of it once they get into it. Okay? But look at, the con look at your Bible. Look at the context then that the Holy Spirit puts that verse in. He does not talk about our sicknesses and how we had a cold and how we had a backache and we ought to be healed from that. Look at what he says, verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Your disease that Christ healed on the cross was sin. Okay? Not a sniffle. Not some kind of back problem or vision problem or whatever, your sickness that is stripes healed was sin. Okay? So let's say, and I, I believe God heals. I believe God still heals people. But let's say that you get healed and God reforms a new liver for you. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. That liver is going to die with you when you die. It's only temporary. And salvation is permanent. It's eternal. So, amen? So if, if God doesn't ever heal me of any disease that I have, and yet He forgives all of my sins, and I get to go to heaven when I die, I'll take that. I'll like that. Verse 25, then, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto, notice the capitalization here, the shepherd and bishop of your soul. So, we have here, cap, and by the way of the capitalization, the King James translators wanted us to know that as far as shepherds in the world, David was a shepherd, Moses was a shepherd, there been other, Saul was a shepherd, there have been other shepherds in the Bible, but there's been no greater shepherd than the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Can you think of a place in the Bible where it talks about the Lord being a shepherd? Go ahead, Jared. Okay, that's one of them. Verse 20, it's Psalm 23. It was the easiest, easiest one I could pick. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. So anyway, turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now watch this now. There's, there's doctrine in this. There's meat in this. There is... 
a help and a shield against false doctrine, false teaching, and, and so on. Because if Christ is the bishop of our souls, does Christ also have to follow the rules that the Bible sets forth for us being, let, let's say it like me. I'm in the office of bishop. There are certain rules that apply to me that do not apply to other people in the church, but they do apply to me. Does Christ then, because he's Christ and he's like the head boss of everybody, does he have to follow the same rules as everybody else does? Do you think politicians are to have the same health care that they dish out to everybody else? Amen. Amen. Okay? Do you think the politicians deserve a better hospital care program than our veterans? No, I don't. I think they ought to take that away from them and give that all that good money and all those good doctors to the veterans, amen. But that's, that's not the rules that they play by. And if it ever comes up, they just vote it down. But anyway, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And what got me thinking about that was this deal. And I mentioned this the other day, this deal about, you know, Dan Brown wrote the Da Vinci Code and put out this idea that, um, that um, um, Christ could have been married to Mary Magdalene and they had, I had a child or had some children there and there's a little group of people running around on the earth that are the lineage of Jesus Christ, which is phony. But they get this from these false Gnostic Gospels that were written during the days of Paul. Paul said, we're not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Already in Paul's day, they were corrupting the Gospels, and Paul knew it. And so you had these false Gospels being written out. Uh, one, the Gospel of Peter, one's the Gospel of, um, uh, Gospel of Barnabas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Judas Iscariot was one of them. And all these little false Gospels, but they give this idea that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married together. Well, then that, that, if you believe the Bible and believe 1 Timothy 3 and the qualification for a bishop, that then disqualifies Jesus from ever being the husband to the church. Because look at what it says. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop. By the way, does anybody know what the word bishop means? Anybody know? Overseer? That's, you're close, but it's a very specific type of overseer. The word bishop and overseer is the same word as shepherd. Over a flock, okay? Right? The shepherd and bishop, you see it tells you that in that verse, doesn't it? The shepherd and bishop of your soul. By the way, the word pastor has the same meaning. Pastor and pasture. Pasture is the ground that the sheep graze in, and the pastor is the shepherd and bishop over the flock that's in the pasture. Okay? That's what pastor means. Anyway, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. <laughs> Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Jesus was blameless. I'm not. Now, does this mean, does this instantly disqualify every man beside Christ from ever being a bishop? Because even though I have sinned, I can become blameless in the eyes of God by having my sins washed away. I have to have the same salvation as everybody else in the church has to have. And that's something that God makes the preacher be just like the people. And I've told you this, it's written in the law where the priest, before he offered a sacrifice for the people, he had to offer one for himself, meaning that he is the same kind of dirty scumbag sinner that everybody else was in. Catholic Church wants you to think that when God calls a man to the Catholic priesthood, that God instantaneously changes him and he doesn't desire women anymore, so he shouldn't ever need to be married. It's not true. And it causes tremendous problems. Tremendous problems. So 
He must be blameless, number one. Number two, the husband of one wife. That means he cannot have four, five, six wives hanging around. He's not to have multiple wives and so on. He must be the husband of one wife. So there, the qualification, Christ is qualified for that because his intention is to marry one bride. It's the church. Amen? He must be vigilant. Christ, as the head bishop, never sleeps. I sleep. Okay? He must be sober. And I don't understand how. It's not just in the cat, but most priests in the Catholic Church are wine bibbers. I would say a large majority of Catholic priests are drunkards and or wine bibbers. Okay? They are far from sober. They serve alcoholic wine at the Mass, which you ought not do. Amen? But see, the Catholic Church is not the only one that does that. Methodists, a lot of Lutheran, a lot of these mainline Presbyterian church of uh, the Christian church and so on, these mainline denominations where they follow this orthodoxy and so on, they have communion every Sunday. Most of these people, most of these churches will serve alcoholic wine, which you should not serve. Let it be said that a lot of people's first introduction to alcohol came at their church. Okay? You should not ever do that. But then you've got a lot... Now you have a lot of... You have a lot of pastors now who have been liberated from the Scriptures. And I'll never forget, I got an invitation years ago to attend a, a pastor's meeting where... And I could, I could just tell by who they were going to have come in and speak at this meeting that it was going to be one of these, let's, let's, let, me, let us show you the Rick Warren way. Let us show you how to, you know, dumb down your church and be seeker friendly and have a big rock band and, you'd, and all this stuff. I could tell that that's how it was. And the meeting of all places for these pastors to meet was going to be at Dave and Buster's. It's a big bar in a pool hall as far as I'm concerned, okay? That's where it was going to be. And I, could, and I went, and I, at the time I didn't know what Dave, I had to look it up. Okay, I went, why are they meeting at a bar? It's a big tavern. Okay, why are we doing that? But I'm finding out more and more and more pastors are being liberated from the Bible and they feel now that it's okay to have a beer with people and have drink wine every now and then. That's not what your Bible says. The Bible says be sober. Not only that, they have to be of good behavior. That means they've got to behave when they're around people, when they're not around people. Christ is noted by his sobriety. He's never been drunk, ever. And he's got good behavior. Given to hospitality. That means he is hospitable to people. And people come to the door and say, uh, we need help with gas. Go on out of here! What do you think this is? Okay, he's not supposed to be that way. And I can't say that I've given to everybody that comes by here. But I try, when people come by, I try to do what I can for them. If they need gas, I don't give them money. Follow me down the gas station. I'll fill you up and give you gas, but I won't give you money. I don't give money to people. Um, I could tell story after, but anyway, i got to move on. But given to hospitality, apt to teach, okay? And I, I went to Bible college with some guys that just could not stand in front of people and give anything. I mean, they just didn't have, the word apt means aptitude. They just, they have an, an acquired or natural ability to at least stand up and present the gospel in a reasonable way or present and teach doctrine and so on. Uh, would, would you say that Christ qualifies as being apt? How, what has Christ taught you? Amen. Not given to wine. There it is. Not given to wine. He turns it down. Wine does not own him. Wine does not move him. It does not dictate him. 
He turns it down. He's not a striker. He is not, uh, which means, and, and you could throw in here, not a brawler, which comes a little bit later on. But he's not a fist fighter. He does not hit his wife. And I've known preachers or heard stories of preachers that beat their wife, hit their wife, and then stand up and smile at everybody and talk about how great their marriage is. That line. But see, the world is going to end up seeing through all this stuff. And God is, is asking guys, and let me just say this, God does not call those who are qualified. God qualifies those whom he calls. Okay? I was not perfect when I entered into the ministry, and I'm not perfect now. But I take this list of rules seriously enough that where in areas where I am a failure, God, will you help me? I want to be a bishop like Jesus is. I don't want to be mean to people. I don't want to hit people. I don't, except my children, of course. Okay, you understand. Okay, I don't, want to, I don't want to be that way. God, I want to be right. And I have the perfect bishop to model my ministry after, and that is Jesus Christ. Okay? So, not, not, not a striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre. Okay? And what has, what has ruined more preachers than just about anything in this world is that they've put their eyes on the money. I was guilty of it. I, I know where it comes from because my whole purpose and dumbing down and Rick Warren and all this stuff years ago was that I thought if I had more people in here, I'd get more money out of it, and boy, I'll just, boy, I'll just be doing well, okay? And that is not to be his mindset. It's not to be what's in his heart. He's not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house. This was an issue that I was not even aware of when Lisa and I got married, and I wanted to get right back into Bible college, finish Bible college, get me a nice church, and this and that and the other, and God hardened my wife's heart, and then God changed mine, and that first summer we're married, I'm not going back to college. I ended up working in construction. And I, I really struggled there for quite a while, because I, I, I thought, well, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be a preacher. You know, here I was before I got married. I mean, I was on the road, man. And now all of a sudden I got married. Now I've got to go out and get my hands dirty and all this stuff. Sweat all day long and everything. Like God had a plan. God had a reason. And I didn't see it. I did not understand it. I, because I was so full of myself at the time that I felt like I, my, my skills are better off not wasting them out here in a construction site. That was my attitude. And it was, it was bad. It was wrong. And God, and what God did was, there for a while, I put ministry right out of my mind. And I started doing better at the work. Became a better painter. I could, you ever seen somebody's house where they got like a gritty sand on the wall and it's in a swirl? I could do that faster than anybody out there. Okay, I got a procedure down. Me and Sterling got a procedure down. We could beat anybody. Sand swirling out of house. Okay, and mainly because I could reach the ceiling from the floor with a brush, doing this, change hands, and do that. I mean, I could do that all day. I was young. I'd do that all day long. Okay, that was when I started getting raises because I started taking an interest in my work and started getting better at it. And I saw that, and, I, and then, you know, that raise, well, that helps my wife. Now she can't work because we had one child. Now she's pregnant with another, a good grief. Okay, and then Courtney came along, and, you know, now i got to go work for everybody. Get a day off every now and then. But what God was doing was, Mike, you don't rule your own house well. Because it says... For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? It says it specifically. And I, was, I either ignored that or didn't, wasn't aware of it. And then, after several years of that, God finally said, Okay, Mike, I'm going to give you a little bit of responsibility in a little bitty church out of Richwoods, Missouri. 
and I was out there for three years. I still worked mainly full-time, sometimes part-time. But God was teaching me how to manage my time. God was teaching me how to work all day so that when I finally became full-time, I had a good work ethic. I got up every day and I came to work and I felt like I'm cheating God and everybody else if I'm not doing here what I'm supposed to be doing. But God had to teach me that because I wasn't good. He qualified me as I went. I was not qualified when I was called. Okay? But I had a good leader to follow, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. I would say that he rules his house well. Amen? Okay? Having his children in subjection with all gravity. Verse 6, not a novice. You know what that means? Huh? A beginner, a newbie, a probie, okay? Um, a greenie, a greenhorn, okay? Not anything like that. The man's got to, he's got to be, uh, he's got to be mature in his behavior and he's got to be mature in the Lord to some degree. Not somebody that just gets saved and then now he's going to go into preaching. It just doesn't work that way, Okay? Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And so here are the qualifications for the bishop. Christ is perfect at every single one of these. And I'm not. But I have a good one to follow. Let me give you this one more, all right? Uh, the prophet. There were prophets all throughout the Bible. Now I want you to think about this. If you've read Isaiah, and you've read Jeremiah or Ezekiel, you'll know that Isaiah, number one, had a different time period which he wrote, and, and a different under different circumstances was he writing, and different prophecies that he gave. You'll note then that Jeremiah came at a different time, Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. He was actually thrown in prison while he, it, you know, in the book of Jeremiah, you'll see that, and you'll see a different ministry out of Jeremiah. You look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel then is seeing things that Jeremiah and Isaiah never saw. Je Ezekiel gets to see the throne of God with the four cherubs and the glory of the Lord like the rainbow. Ezekiel gets to see that. Jeremiah and Isaiah know nothing about it. But Ezekiel gets to see it. And he, but he has a different group of people that he's writing to at a different time. And then when you get into the New Testament, you'll notice that you know, Matthew writes differently than Luke does. Or uh, John is completely different than the other three Gospels. And Peter's letters are different than Paul's letters. Jude's, his is real short, but it's to the point. You'll notice that there are differences amongst all of these Bible writers. And yet, every one of them displayed a unique characteristic that belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the prophet. And when you read Isaiah, you see a, a piece of Christ in Isaiah. When you read David, you see a, a, David was a man after the Lord's own heart. So definitely, you're going to see a part of Jesus in David and portrayed through David. Just see, every one of these men, that's why there are no zero women writers of the Bible. Because all of them have to portray a characteristic of Jesus Christ. What would Jesus say if he lived in the times of Jeremiah? Well, we know what he would say. Jeremiah said them. Okay, what would John say? Well, we or excuse, what would Jesus say during... The, you know, the last part of the Bible. Well, we know it because it was Jesus. So here's the prophet. Deuteronomy 18. Turn there very quickly. And I'm going to cut you loose. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. Notice the translators capitalize the letter P. They got it. They understood who this was. They knew that it was prophesying of and fulfilled in Christ. God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren. Meaning, Jesus was obviously a Jew. Okay? Like unto me, unto him ye shall... Heart. Here's that phrase, like unto me. Remember what I just said? Moses had a unique character about himself, and yet he was portraying 
the image of Christ, what would Christ say to the Jews at this time? He would say exactly what Moses said to them and nothing different. Like unto me, he said, um, like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. Verse 16, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. Now, let me stop right here. Those of you who are wanting to hear from God, let me tell you, if you think that you want to hear directly from God the Father, you will not be able to bear it. If God started speaking directly to you, you would immediately say, Stop! I can't bear this! Because God was speaking directly to Israel at Mount Sinai, and they were going, Stop! The terror of the Lord in his voice was on them, and they were not able to stand up to it. So they begged Moses, please tell God, quit talking to us. From now on, Moses, you go and hear what God said, and then you bring that to us. And what was being established was, was the office of the prophet and the office of the mediator. God was going to speak to and through his prophets. Then his prophets were going to speak to us. So the Bible tells us to believe those prophets. Whether it's Moses or David or Solomon or Isaiah or Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. Believe what the prophets said. Do we believe in latter day prophets? Not to the extent that Ooh, I'm hearing from God right now. Ooh, it's a, oh, it's going to be a great revelation. And generally, it's going to involve you getting your checkbook out. Okay? But these guys are lying through their teeth about, oh, I'm hearing from God right now. I'm hearing from God right now. If God spoke to any one of us, we'd die just like that. Because that's what happens here. So anyway, verse 7, And the Lord said unto them, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Meaning, you want to hear from God? Open your Bible. If that's not good enough for you, it's going to be a very sad day for you on Judgment Day because I'm going to require these words from you. If you don't hearken to these words that he spoke in my name, then I'm going to require it of you on Judgment Day. We're going to be judged by and from this book and nothing else. Okay? So, watch this. The Jews all knew this prophecy. So they're waiting for that prophet. So, John 4, 19, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. But then in John 7, 40, Many of the people therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Capital P. Because they knew the prophecy. They knew that a prophet was going to come. And many of them, when they heard Jesus, they went, That's him. That's the prophet that Moses said was coming to us of, of us, of us people that Moses said, and many of them believed it. Do you? You believe it. Out of all these guys in the Bible, all of them were sinners. And yet, the Holy Ghost sanctified them because the Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But the prophet above all the prophets is Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Mm. Next week, the angel of the Lord. The angel. The apostle. The high priest. Could you think of any, any others? Any offices? Huh? Missed that one. Governor? Miss that one. Got that one. Got that one. 
Stop it. <laughs> okay, I'll go add some of these for next week. All right. Father, I thank you. Jesus, I thank you for being my example. You were good as my bishop. And I want to be like you. I want to do this thing the way you do it. And I know that I'll never attain to that because no one, no one man on this earth deserves the glory that you deserve. But Father, I want to be like you. I want to be a good pastor. I want to be a good shepherd. I want to be a good bishop. I don't want to pretend that I'm saying something from God that's not true. But Lord, I do want to be a prophet in that I want to speak boldly and proclaim out loud, thus saith the Lord from the word of God. But there was no better prophet than you. You got it right every single time. And Lord, I don't want to stand and tell anybody anything that's wrong. I don't want to lie to people, knowingly or unknowingly. So Father, help me to be, help us all. If we prophesy, thus saith the Lord, help us to do it with all of our heart, all of our might, all of our strength, and Lord, as we stick to the words that are in this book, there'll be no way we can be wrong. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for what you are to us. Lead us, your sheep, and guide us and keep us. And thank you for keeping yourself holy and pure and only selecting one bride, and that's us. Thank you for not running off with another woman because we really love you. We thank you for these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our mediator, and our Savior, and all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.